Beneath the moon's silent surface lies helium-3, an isotope nearly extinct on Earth, but seeded here by eons of solar wind. For decades, it was only a theory. In 2020, one nation brought back proof, and by 2022, that nation confirmed a new lunar mineral carrying this elusive element. If harnessed, helium-3 could transform energy itself. But now, with China holding the breakthrough, who controls our next chapter? And what does that mean for the rest of the world? Helium-3 is not native to the moon. Instead, it arrives as a steady rain from the sun, carried by the solar wind. For billions of years, this invisible stream has bombarded the lunar surface, implanting helium-3 ions into the outermost layer of dust and rock. The moon's lack of atmosphere and magnetic field leaves it exposed, allowing these particles to settle directly into the regolith. Over time, this process has scattered helium-3 across the surface, but only in extremely low concentrations, typically between 4 and 10 parts per billion. Most of it resides within the top few centimeters of soil, where each grain has quietly absorbed trace amounts through countless solar cycles. Unlike gold or oil, there are no rich veins or concentrated pockets to be found. Instead, helium-3 is spread thinly, almost invisibly, across vast plains of lunar dust. This means that any attempt to collect meaningful quantities must focus on these shallow layers, requiring the excavation and processing of enormous volumes of regolith. The rarity and delicate distribution of helium-3 define the challenge ahead. A resource, born from cosmic weather, locked within the moon's surface, waiting for the right technology to unlock its potential. In December 2020, a small capsule streaked through Earth's atmosphere and parachuted down onto the frozen fields of Inner Mongolia. Inside were 1.7 kilograms of lunar soil and rock, the first samples returned from the moon since the 1970s. This was the centerpiece of China's Chang'e 5 mission, a feat of robotics and precision that brought back material from Oceanus Procellarum, a volcanic plain untouched by previous missions. Within days, teams at the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology and the Chinese Academy of Sciences began their work. Each gram of regolith was catalogued, divided, and analyzed under strict cleanroom conditions. Scientists used advanced mass spectrometry and X-ray diffraction to search for new clues about the moon's history and resources. In 2022, their efforts produced a breakthrough. Researchers identified a new phosphate mineral, Change Site Y, hidden within the lunar dust. Its structure was unlike anything found in Apollo or Luna samples. More importantly, Change Site Y contained measurable traces of helium-3, a direct laboratory confirmed link between the moon's geology and the promise of fusion energy. News of the discovery spread quickly through China's scientific community. For the analysts who had spent months sifting through lunar grains, it was a moment of quiet triumph. The ability to not just retrieve, but to certify and characterize new minerals marked a leap in national capability. For China, the Chang'e 5 return and the discovery of Change Site Y transformed lunar regolith from a scientific curiosity into a strategic asset with potential far beyond the laboratory. For decades, fusion researchers have dreamed of a reactor fueled by helium-3. In theory, fusing helium-3 with deuterium could generate vast amounts of energy while producing only a fraction of the radioactive waste found in today's nuclear plants. Unlike conventional fusion, which releases torrents of high-energy neutrons, helium-3 reactions emit far fewer, reducing damage to reactor walls and surrounding materials. This cleaner profile hints at a future where power stations could run with less shielding, lower long-term contamination, and less hazardous waste to manage. Yet, every promise comes with a caveat. No laboratory has yet achieved a working helium-3 fusion reactor that produces more energy than it consumes. The physics are unforgiving, demanding temperatures and pressures even higher than those needed for standard fusion fuels. Leading experts, from physicists at Princeton to engineers in Beijing, caution that the technical hurdles remain immense. Some call helium-3 fusion a beautiful idea, not a near-term solution. Even so, the allure is hard to ignore. The prospect of abundant, clean energy keeps scientists and governments searching for a breakthrough, convinced that if the technology can be mastered, the rewards would be unlike anything seen before. 
This hope, paired with skepticism, drives the push to extract Helium-3 from the Moon and to solve the engineering puzzle that stands between lunar dust and a new age of energy. Extracting Helium-3 from the Moon is not a question of finding a rich deposit. It is an industrial gauntlet. Each kilogram of Helium-3 demands processing roughly 500,000 tons of lunar regolith. That means entire fleets of robotic excavators would need to scrape, sift, and transport mountains of dust, all to collect a few grams at a time. The regolith itself is more than just dirt. It is sharp, abrasive, and chemically reactive, wearing down machinery with every pass. Engineers designing lunar mining systems face a material that clings to surfaces, jams moving parts, and grinds through seals, problems that Earth-based mining rarely encounters at this scale. The extraction process is equally unforgiving. Helium-3 remains trapped until the regolith is heated to several hundred degrees Celsius, often above 600 degrees Celsius in a vacuum environment. This step alone requires enormous amounts of energy. On the moon, power is a precious commodity. Solar arrays can only operate during the two-week lunar day, leaving machinery idle for the 14-day night unless nuclear reactors are deployed, a solution that brings its own risks and logistical hurdles. As one lunar mining engineer put it, moving a million tons of rock in a place with no atmosphere, an endless night isn't just hard, it's unprecedented. That was Dr. Li Ziying of the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology. Each of these barriers multiplies the complexity and cost, turning the promise of Helium-3 into one of the most daunting engineering challenges ever conceived. In Vienna, diplomats gather each spring under the banner of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. The faces change, but the core debate remains unresolved. On one side, delegates argue that the Moon and its resources belong to all humanity, protected by treaties that forbid any nation from claiming territory or exclusive rights. On the other, a growing chorus insists that investment and risk must be rewarded, and that the right to extract, use, or even own lunar resources is essential for progress. Draft language circulates through committee rooms and working groups. Some proposals call for a new international regime to manage the benefits of lunar mining, echoing the old promise of the Moon Agreement. Others, led by the United States and Artemis Accords countries, maintain that resource extraction is legal as long as no sovereign claim is made. China's statements are measured but pointed, affirming the need for further negotiation, but refusing to accept unilateral moves or exclusive access. Russia warns of de facto zones of influence creeping across the lunar surface, disguised as safety corridors or coordination zones. No binding agreement emerges. Instead, each session ends with carefully worded reports that note the differences without resolving them. The legal status of Helium-3 remains suspended between national ambition and the idea of common heritage. As lunar missions multiply and the prospect of resource extraction draws closer, the world's diplomats find themselves caught between the promise of shared progress and the risk of a new frontier defined by power and exclusion. What happens next is a question of policy and will. Will states agree on a shared framework that balances scientific cooperation, commercial investment, and the protections promised by existing treaties? Or will rival interpretations of law and interest produce fences on a world that was meant to be open to all? These are not abstract questions. They are policy flashpoints that could define who benefits from the moon and who does not. The tensions are real, and the stakes are global. As plans for lunar infrastructure and resource programs advance, diplomats will be pushed to make hard choices. The outcomes of these negotiations will shape the next decades of space activity, and they may determine whether lunar resources become a common resource, a commodity for a few, or something else entirely. For now, in conference halls and working groups, the debate continues. The faces change, the language shifts, but the core dilemma remains. The moon is quiet, but the questions about access, rights, and responsibility are loud, and the world will have to answer them before the first large-scale extraction ever begins. China's lunar roadmap sketches out a future that no longer belongs to science fiction. By the early 2030s, automated machines could begin to shape the regolith into something more than dust, robotic excavators and mobile processing units working through the endless lunar day. These fleets would scrape, sift, and heat the upper layers, inch by inch, seeking out the faint signature of Helium-3. Overhead, solar fields and compact nuclear units would provide the power needed to run these operations. 
their energy pulsing through cables stretched across the Grey Plains. Plans for an international research station developed in partnership with Russia call for a permanent outpost, first robotic, then human by the late 2030s. Early phases focus on building infrastructure, landing pads, processing hubs, and energy storage, all assembled by robotic teams that can survive the harsh cycles of light and darkness. By the 2040s, these outposts may attempt the first true extraction experiments, testing whether lunar mining can deliver helium-3 in usable quantities. The urgency grows as Earth's cities swell and energy demand climbs. Fossil fuels falter, grids strain, and the promise of clean, constant power becomes more than a scientific ambition. It becomes a necessity. In this vision, the moon's surface is no longer a distant landscape, but a front line in the search for energy security. The next two decades will test whether humanity can bridge the gap between lunar dreams and the realities of global need. Today, China's lunar sample returns mark a real shift, proof that off-world resources are entering global strategy. As nations weigh treaties and technology, the moon's helium-3 remains more than a promise. It is a question of who shapes the next era of energy and who gets left in the dark.